everyone, welcome back to the Earthbound Survival Guide, the podcast for all disciplines, paths, players, and game masters, with your questers, Josh and Dan. I am Dan. I am Josh. And on today's podcast, we will be discussing all things quizzical and virgigormical as we talk about the cult of the great hunter. But we have emails to get to first. Speaking of emails, if you have one for us, please drop us a line at edsgpodcast at gmail.com and we'll get right to those. And speaking of Virgigorm, yes, we've got a Kickstarter going on right now with probably about a week left as of the original air date of this mm-hmm. that allows you to get a massive miniature of the great hunter himself emerging from a portal looking all like sinewy and wormy and nasty and clutching a dragon skull in one hand. It's pretty awesome. It shall be mine. Check that awesome. out. Check the links. Uh, Grand Bazaar Kickstarter through June 14th, 2022. Absolutely. I already pledged mine. They're getting every penny I've got. So we're in good shape there. So on to some quizzical emails we have. Uh, I think we got five this time around. Uh, we Sounds do have a right. special one, which we'll get to last. Yes. Hi, Dan and Josh. Hi, Josh. Your podcast has really helped me get into Earth Dawn. Thank you so much for taking the time to make it happen. Question. Do pattern items lose their link to the pattern they represent? if the items spend enough time physically away and disassociated from the main pattern. For example, if a pattern item for Trevar or Icewing was dumped into the sea, would enough time passing render it useless as a pattern item? And what about group pattern items? Thanks again, Brendan. Short answer, yes. Longer answer, it's complicated, (laughs) as is the case with so many things relating to pattern items. A lot of the likelihood of such a thing happening will depend upon how important the pattern item is. Uh, A core pattern item is likely to remain a pattern item for quite some time, even if it is separated in some way from the associated true pattern. The reason for that is obviously a core pattern item is such a strong representative of the associated pattern that that spiritual slash philosophical connection is going to remain in place in the minds of people collectively and the expression of that connection works on the magic to maintain it. A major pattern item would probably also last a while but might eventually, if something else came along that supplanted it in terms of its importance, then that might happen. Minor pattern items, on the other hand, it is possible for them to sort of pop up and go away, depending on the vagaries of magic and things. I seem to recall in the player's guide where it's talking about studying a pattern item, you need to perhaps be careful about how long you handle it, because it's possible that your intense study and association with that item might affect how it relates to its associated pattern. So yes, it is possible. Group pattern items are their own weird thing. I would be inclined to feel that as long as the group is active and continuing to maintain its oath and its existence and its operation, that any of the group pattern items that were created for that would be maintained by that artificial true pattern that's created as a result of the group ritual and would not just fade if they got misplaced or lost or something like that. If the individual for whom that is the group pattern item were to leave the group for some reason, whether due to death or retirement or a, no longer renewing the oath as is required periodically on that, then that pattern item might eventually lose its connection. I think it would still maintain that to a certain extent, but a lot of that would depend on what makes for a good story in the moment. But I think that like active members of the group, their group pattern items would stay in place for as long as they continued to maintain that group. Fair enough. Uh, you heard it here, folks. So from the mouth of the man on to the one from Andy titled working together. Hi, both yet another question. Sorry. Are there bonuses for working together, assisting with a skill, for example, 
We've looked and three of us are sure we've read something somewhere, but we can't find it. Thanks, Andy. You are probably thinking about the section in the enchanting chapter about having assistance when you are performing enchanting. That is the closest thing in any of the rule books that actually exists. There is not anything by default that has really existed in any of the editions in terms of a direct help out kind of thing where you can have somebody assist to provide bonuses to somebody else's test or something like that. I would say quick and dirty. There's a couple of different ways that you could handle it. You know, usually in a situation like this, you're looking at a sustained action or something along those lines, like something that takes time or could involve multiple people. But the way that you would potentially handle it is to perhaps set a success threshold. You need to achieve so many successes and just have everybody who wants to take part roll the relevant skill or ability and just figure out based on the base target number how many total successes get generated in that. That's one option. And that's kind of like mechanically the simplest in one sense. Uh, Another thing that you could do is have the person who wants to help make a roll and each success that they generate perhaps provides a bonus to the test that's being made by the primary person. The downside of that is that the net effect of helping someone out is not going to be as good as simply tallying up the successes that are rolled as additional successes. I don't know. It is something that I think is lacking in the game in some respects, but it's not something that we have strongly explored in terms of how to make that work from a mechanical standpoint, because it's not something that has ever been described really in the rules previously. And so the framework just isn't there. And we've had other things that we've been working on. But those are two ideas that I would have in terms of how to approach helping out. And a a lot of that depends on how much of an impact you want it to potentially have. And you could make a case by case basis call depending on exactly what's going on and what's trying to be done and stuff like that. Absolutely. I've only ever done one where we had to pool strength to lift to like close a cave door or something along those lines. And it was just three people take the strength steps, add the strength steps together, roll that, roll that step number of dice and try and hit the highest target number you possible. So, you know, it was first edition rules, but we haven't done it for fourth edition in quite a while. So just, it was. Yeah, that's, that's another quick, possibility. <laughs> not, not the best solution. <laughs> I feel like there's some mathematical analysis that I would want to do to try and kind of figure out the best way to approach that. But that's a lot of work and I have other <laughs> things that I've been doing. <laughs> Way down the list of priorities. No worries. Uh, thank you for that one, Andy. So on to one from Alan. The everyday world of a horror stalker. Dear Josh and Dan, I'm always a first day listener of the podcast. No matter the topic, I always find you guys informative, funny, and thought provoking. Keep up the good work. Recently, my character has experienced a question of loyalty, and I would love to hear your thoughts on the matter. In short, my sixth circle weaponsmith has started down the horror stalker path. In doing so, he has acquired astral sight. Much to his chagrin and perhaps furthering his paranoia of all things horror, he has discovered that two of his group members have been horror marked. He has learned no details beyond this simple fact. Around the same time, their group pattern has popped up for renewal. My character has decided not to renew his membership in the group pattern. He is on the outs. He feels that if he enters back into the group pattern and one of the two horror marked individuals does something against the group, he will have to retaliate, even killing a member of his group pattern. If this occurs, he feels this violates the group pattern blood oath, which has some nasty consequences. His thinking is if he were not a member of the group pattern, he would be free to intervene if one of the horror-marked individuals did something to endanger the group. It is quite the quandary. As an extension of that, questions come to mind. Can a horror somehow spread its corrupting influence to other group members if the horror already has its talons into one of the members? Could they manipulate the marked members into doing things to help them mark other group members? Or perhaps use their victim's group pattern item to weave threads of their own to gain bonuses against said group? Like I said, my weaponsmith horror stalker is a dilly of a pickle. I can't wait to hear your musings on this subject. Sincerely yours, Alan. So, I'm going to get to kind of the later questions first, because they're pretty easy to answer. 
can a horror somehow spread its corrupting influence to other members of the uh, if the horror already has its talents into one of the members? Yeah, absolutely. It's a possibility. <laughs> a lot of this depends on the horror, the specific horror involved and what their methods are and how they do things. But it is absolutely yeah. A, a, a possibility could they manipulate the marked member into doing things to help the mark other group members oh do, yeah maybe. they could or perhaps use the victim's group pattern item to weave threads of their own to gain bonuses against said group yes <laughs> yes yes and yes horrors are Even. are nasty and they do things that are otherwise potentially impossible or dangerous or whatever that's part of the reason why they are as dangerous and awful as they are if you were not aware the first edition adventure collection blades basically revolves around this whole idea. The blades of Carafad, really brief kind of basic spoilers here. I'm not going to get into any specific plot details of the various adventures that are part of this collection. But basic idea is the blades of Carafad are the blades that were the pattern items of a group that existed back before the scourge, like long, long ago. And one of their members got marked, and that mark basically ended up resulting in a curse on the Blades themselves and causing all sorts of problems for the original group that had them. The Blades Adventure Collection is as the group investigates the key knowledges of these Blades, because they have really, really nice powers that they discover sort of the history of what's going on and the curse and find out that they are now wrapped up in it themselves and need to take action to break it. But yeah, like the whole basic concept of that is, is that a, a horror marked a member of this company, that company's true pattern, essentially the group's true pattern got marked in a sense, got corrupted, got cursed by this horror. And that is an ongoing issue for the future. But yes, absolutely. That's it's a it's it's fantastic. To address your concerns in terms of the initial description, yeah, uh your weaponsmith is in a rough yep. position. And I can't say that I necessarily disagree with the conclusions that he is making, especially if he is a horror stalker. One of the strong aspects of a group true pattern is that group oath of blood piece. And if they feel that they would not be able to honor that oath if one of their group's companions were to act against them or, you know, were like if they had to do something to stop their friend from or their companion from doing something and they feel that it would break the oath to do so, then absolutely. This is like a, a really tough situation and I hope it is one that is being handled appropriately within the group at a player and GM level. It might be something that you sort of take a step back and maybe address at that player meta level and say, look, here's what's going on, because there is a recognition that if you are not going to renew that oath and you are no longer part of the group, you are no longer going to benefit from the bonuses that come about as a result of being a part of that group. And Phenomenal story, phenomenal like role playing potential, lots of cool stuff going on here with that. It's just you want to make sure that on some level, everybody is kind of on the same page in terms of what sort of story you are going for with this. And this feels to me like if this is something that's going on, the group probably should be working as hard as they can in order to resolve that difficulty however they might choose to do so. And I think if the group is not, that could provide even more tension and stress for your character, of course, as a horror stalker, to try and put a stop to it. But good on you for role-playing it as deeply as you are role-playing it. I applaud you, sir. Yeah. No, this is this is all absolutely... Now, to kind of like tie the, the second batch of mm -hmm. questions into your basic story... You might want to talk with your GM about how much your character actually knows about that sort of thing. Horror stalkers do have a sort of half magic 
enhancement that provides them some additional information about horrors and what they can do and stories and legends that have been told. They might need to go and consult other horror stalkers to find out some information about this. I mean, there's a lot of different ways that you could go with it, but you do want to, on some level, perhaps be a little careful in terms of your player knowledge, not necessarily overly influencing your character's knowledge and actions if it's not something that they would otherwise be aware of without a test or getting the information somewhere or just simply saying my character being super paranoid is not going to enter into any kind of like oath or agreement or whatever with somebody that they know is horror yeah. marked because uh, it's, it's a few circles before they get bare mark so it's it's a it's a ways up there in a sense they kind of are by being a horror stalker they have entered a another kind of oath with people who likely are or will at some point be horror marked, of course, with the horror stalkers. But that is a very different situation and one that is narratively, it's a different perspective. It's a different feeling. I think part of what like being a horror stalker is the recognition that if a fellow horror stalker is somehow succumbing to, you know, the influence of a horror, then it is your duty to put that sibling in the path out of their misery to either cleanse them of the taint in some way or to put them down to prevent whatever harm they might do in the future. Now, there's a lot of cool potential there. Thank you for sending that in. I like that. Oh, yeah. And and keep us informed, by the way. We want to hear how this turns out because now you've piqued my interest and I need to have a resolution on that one eventually. Uh, so, yeah, if you have rank one astral site, then bear mark can pretty much be soon thereafter. So, um, hopefully you get bear mark soon. That might change your opinion. Anyway, on to our next one, uh, a kind of a longer one from Jesse, who's been written to us before. Um, hello, Dan and Josh. I have a lore question for you and a long setup. So bear with me. The Serpent River source book describes how the Shivala Hala Sirtis combined ancestral memories with inform with information extracted from dragons through riddles to create an addendum to the rites of protection and passage. This addendum explained how Tuscrang could enter a kind of hibernation to suppress the claustrophobia that Tuscrang typically feel. Then, in the third edition adventure Ardanian's Revenge, the Tuscrang of the Catan Vras Nial in the Care have emerged from hibernation only a few months prior to the start of the adventure. Yet at the same time, it seems that the Shiva Lahala Sirtis was awake and fought off six horrors that breached the defenses of Cliff City. And in the discussion of the Kitsulami, the author talks about how the Kitsulami born during the scourge were considered very unlucky because they would go mad without being able to leave the village domes under the water. So my questions are these. What was the hibernation of the Tuscrang like, and how did it function? Were they actually asleep for the entire scourge? Did this extend the lifespan of those that entered hibernation at the start of the scourge and thus lived through until they came out of hibernation? Or was it more like they were went through long periods of hibernation, but woke up occasionally and had normal lifespans. If that was the case, then how did the population survive as you, as you would have several generations of people born, grow up and die while spending a significant amount of their lives in hibernation? He's got more, but I think that's plenty to unwrap. Yeah, 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 yeah. Well, so, so I don't have any answers for this. I wish I did. I've been reading some reviews uh, that have been getting done of Earth Dawn products, both first edition and fourth edition. And one of the things that sort of pops up several times in the reviews of, of this individual, which I am enjoying tremendously, by the way, I think they're great insights. But this kind of thing that comes up is how the scourge and the time spent hiding in the scourge seems to freeze cultures it was 400 years why is it that there's this cultural continuity like say for example the city of trevar right which had this collection of merchant houses that were operating prior to the scourge and then the care closes up and the same houses are the ones that emerge after without any real yeah, they didn't notable I mean, some stuff happened during the scourge, but there was not any real notable cultural shakeups or shifting of priorities or like rises and falls of individuals or whatever. 400 years is a long time. If we think about that right here, we are in 2022. It would be like, you know, 1600, 
right? Like 400 years ago, we're talking about like basically going back to the colonial era, you know, the, the beginning of the, of the colonial, the, the British colonization of, of the Americas. Mm-hmm. And now admittedly, we have had this incredible technological revolution here since the industrial revolution and whatnot, but let's change that around. Let's say 1600, we go back 400 years to 1200. There is a lot of stuff that happens in terms of the rise and fall of nations and empires and houses and noble houses and all of this stuff that happens over the course of that time. Why is it that so many of the locations during the scourge, like kind of go in, they go in a certain way, they're a certain way at the beginning of the scourge. And then when the scourge is over, they come out and things haven't changed a whole lot. Like mm-hmm. that's even the case with with Thrall. Like there was some sort of political stuff that happened in Thrall with regards to the council compact and some of the reforms that were pushed by Varilus during that time. But yeah, like a lot of it is just, yeah, things were a certain way and then the scourge happened and we come out and things continue to sort of be the same way. And this is, a, in fairness, a critique that can be applied to any kind of fantasy game that has like a, a, a so-called deep history that just the amount of time that is spanned by it does not necessarily reflect the realities of how much culture would change over the multiple generations. So like you've got elves who would be longer lived and so you would have fewer generations, but you talk about humans where a generation is like 30 years, you're looking at 10 to 12 generations, give or take, of humans, and perhaps even more of orcs or trolls. And again, like the the troll crystal raiders, like these are the clans that went in and the same clans came out and things were all just kind of the same that like the scourge kind of froze things. So to get back to the question about the Tuscrang, Yeah. I get the sense that because this is something that was kind of presented in the Serpent River book and maybe uh, somewhat in the Denizens book. So the early stuff was something that was a cool idea that kind of played with the notion of the Tuscrang without really getting too deep into how the mechanics of it all actually worked. Like, your questions are legitimate. It's like, I don't know. It doesn't really say. Like, yes, it said they went into hibernation so that they would not go stir crazy while they were trapped inside because the Tuscrang, of course, loved to be on the river and in motion and things like that. But at the same time, okay, it doesn't really say that, yeah, it put them all in sort of suspended animation effectively. And so therefore, the Tuscrang that went into the shelters and underwent the hibernation were the same ones who emerged 400 years later or 500 years later. But what about the Tuscrang that might have been in places that didn't have access to such magic? And, you know, again, the Shivalahala Sirtis, like, sort of woke up from time to time and fought off horrors and stuff. It's just, it's a cool thing. Don't, I feel like, don't pull on the thread too hard. But that's also, like, kind of dismissive. Like, I recognize the questions. I just don't have answers for them. Fair. He does have a part two. How, so he wants to know how widespread was this practice, however it might have worked, because in Denizens Volume 1 makes it fairly clear that the jungle to Scrang of the Servos did not hibernate and did not have cares, at least not in the traditional sense. Also, in the story of the Elmara Windling community in the floating city, it appears that the city was a citadel, which wouldn't have required the Scrang to live in a way that would have induced claustrophobia, and so they probably wouldn't have needed to hibernate. I realize this is a really into the weeds or maybe reads of the lore around the survival during the long night, but I figure it's about Tuscrang. She probably wouldn't mind the question because Tuscrang are great. Thank you, Jesse. Yeah, thank you. Um, Yeah, I mean, this is a really like deep weeds thing, and it's not something that I have thought about too deeply. And yeah, there are examples of Tuscrang who did not have this sort of hibernation thing and just kind of carried on as they otherwise would have Mm -hmm. this is the sort of thing that you run into not just in earth dawn from time to time but in lots of other games where you come up with a cool idea and don't necessarily think about 
what the ramifications of it are because we as people actually kind of suck at understanding deep time. <laughs> yeah. How much things change and cultural shifts and and all kinds of stuff that can happen. It's really cool. They're good questions. I wish I had good answers for you in terms of the whole hibernation yeah, thing, but sorry, I don't. Man. Maybe right up your own. Who knows? Uh, last one. We have a special email uh, from Fraser Kane. Hi, guys. Uh, I just found out about your podcast. It was a blast from the past. Smiley face. I worked on a few Earth Dawn and Shadowrun books back in the day when I was an RPG writer. I was also best friends with Nigel D. Findlay, who died in 1995. I'd be... Yes, the late lamented Nigel. Long lamented. Uh, I'd be happy to do an interview about the history of some of this stuff if you were interested. Also, you're pronouncing Vastinjas wrong. Fraser. First off, Fraser, thank you so much for writing. Absolutely. That is great. My guess is it's Vastinjas, like... Uh, Maybe. I don't know. That's a tease. Like you're pronouncing it wrong, but does not give any indication as to the <laughs> correct pronunciation. Anyway, happy to hear from you. Yeah. So Fraser Kane is the publisher of Universe Today, which is a, uh, a science mm -hmm. thing that I am passingly familiar with. I did not realize that it was the same Fraser Kane. Well, it's kind of a unique until name, this email came in. I never, I sort of recognized the name Fraser Kane from the science communicators and mm -hmm. stuff that I follow, yeah. but did not it at any point make the connection that the name was the same as this name that appeared in some of the early Earth Dawn and Shadowrun materials. I think that is incredibly cool. Absolutely. I don't have anything more to say than that, to, to that, except... Thank you for writing in, Fraser. Um, or you know what? It's next it's time, fantastic. Fraser, call us, leave us a voicemail, and pronounce Vastenjas <laughs> properly. So Vastenjas, as I'm guessing, or Vasdenyas, maybe Vasdenyas. That sounds. Pretty I don't cool. know. Anyway, uh, that's that's a possi uh, that's a possibility. Actually, that's yeah. kind of cool. Anyway, he did give a little smiley face. Absolutely. So, so appreciate you. Maybe that's a question. Appreciate for you, Lou. Fraser, and uh, thank you for appreciating us back. So uh, now. With that out, out of the way, we can get down to the brass tacks of the cult of the Great Hunter. Um, this is, uh, yeah, these are some special, special people here who have decided to openly worship the horror Vergigorm, the hunter of great dragons. This takes a special yeah. kind of, this takes a special kind of follower. I'm just going to say that right now. Yeah. Special thoughts on this. Oh, these are awesome, awesome antagonists. If you want to be running a potentially high powered game involving the horrors, because obviously Vergie is, <laughs> I call him Vergie, you know, we're, we're tight. Vergigorm is supposed to be like the pinnacle of horrordom, according to one creation myth. Virgigorm is actually the one responsible for spawning all of the horrors and, by extension, the dragons and whatnot. He is a huge, big, nasty, gribbly mm -hmm. thing. And so people that worship or follow him in some sense make a great organization that could cause problems for characters throughout their totally. careers but could potentially, you know, have higher powered obstacles or objectives that would require warden or master tier adepts in order to like stop them or yeah, whatever. This was a very well done essay. I will say it was, it was nice that it was parsed out into different letters and you could get the sense that it has a history as to where it came from. It actually mentioned Ardelia in there. Just a brief history that Ardelia had an obsidian, obsidian sculpture of a common dragon and it somehow ended up in Icewing's lair. Icewing fled that lair. Cultists the, of the Great Hunter used this sculpture to find the egg clutch of Icewing. And this took a lot of dedication and skill and all kinds of things. The eggs were, of course, saved. And the sculpture got back to Icewing somehow because he, you know, he's got minions as well. So it's just yeah. there's a whole history here about this whole thing. So the whole history that's sort of described in the letters and whatnot is all tied in hardcore to some of the first edition published adventures 
and storylines that were part of that. A lot of these notes are from Hefera, who, if uh, you have read or played through the Dragon's Daughter plot of Barsave of uh, Prelude to War, um, you should recognize uh, Hefera was a sort of notable antagonist uh, in that adventure. The Book of Blue Spirits is mentioned. Ardelia is mentioned. The Obsidian Sculpture also shows up. All of those initially show up in the uh, first edition adventure, Infected. The Dragon Sculpture then reappears in Shattered Pattern. The Shattered Pattern actually revolves around a sect of the Cult of the Great Hunter, and the statue is used as a way for the cult to find some dragon eggs and start performing their awful warping magic on them. In the course of that adventure, as you play through it, you can recover the the statue and return it to Icewing. So yeah, like everything that's sort of being talked about in here is events that in theory, uh, first edition player character groups could have been involved with to a certain extent. And so this is very kind of meta plot tied into very what's well done, going on. Since it has, you know, since it's, as you pointed out, multiple published adventures that would weave through all these events. So very well done tying all that together into like a six page essay. So no lie. The interesting thing about the cult of the great hunter is, as Josh pointed out, there's more than one. They are not interrelated. They don't really know about each other. They don't check up on each other. They don't coordinate plans. They just all... <laughs> for their own sake, of these little startups that have decided to dedicate themselves to Vergigorm without exception, and but they still can kind of somehow gravitate to this magical group pattern thing and gain some benefits from it. So it's a very weird, weird thing going on. This is something that, once again, would be ideal for working up as a path of sorts because the structure of that uh, allows special bonuses and abilities to be made available. There aren't any really that are given within here for like special unique abilities the way that you do with some of the quest stores or, yeah. or whatnot. But yeah, the basic idea in a sense is that the existence of the cult of the great hunter its existence as a as a notion as a as a entity in a sense in the worship of this entity there are a couple of different ways if you wanted to do some some strange mechanical stuff yeah. that you could model it you could set it up as a path um since paths are in a way based off of the the framework that was developed for questors you could actually kind of work it up as a questor like relationship perhaps the leaders of the individual sects who frequently are higher circle yeah. magicians, it it says in the essay, could in a sense like be questors of Virgigorm and perhaps be granted bonuses or powers uh, as a result of their worship of this entity. Perhaps different organizations handle it in different ways. Perhaps there is one sect that does like traditional group pattern magic as adepts understand it. You've got a bunch of different groups that are devoted to this unspeakably ancient evil. and powerful it's and evil. evil entity. You're really kind of starting to tread into the almost mm -hmm. Lovecraftian style of cults and horrors and things like that and just come up with weird stuff, provide them with bonuses you know, one of the things that mechanically sort of allowing any member of the cult of the great hunter to access sort of true pattern magic, group pattern magic, is that it potentially boosts their abilities up to make them a little bit more of a obstacle or problem for more experienced adept groups, because experienced adept groups are likely to be the ones that are going to be tracking down members of this cult or might come to the attention of members of this cult if they are somehow interfering with their plans. But this is another potentially wide spanning conspiracy type group or organization that you could have as a long term campaign antagonist or threat. Absolutely. That you are dealing because, with. Because as we said, there are many non-related groups from one another and not every group knows each other the other group's endeavors so 
they both could be working for different ends. And so you can come across one group in one session, three or four sessions later, come across the second group, same cult in name only, uh, with different means, different ways and so forth and so on. So this can be an ever changing antagonist that you come across with different sets of powers because this, this one built their, their group pattern a little bit differently from here on out. And to Josh's point, so when you are going to build this out as your, as you, the game master, each cell of the cult of the great hunter, uh, has a commonality. There's a high circle magician somewhere in its ranks, not necessarily the leader, but somewhere in its ranks. And that high circle magician or that, sorry, that leader has at least one to four lieutenants who are adepts. That's where your magician could be. If they're not the leader, some of these, uh, sects actually are run by, you know, beast masters or warriors. I, mean, I think they won't even have a troubadour in there listed. And some cells have between 15 and 20 members. There's a maybe one or two that has more than 30. So good luck with that. A lot of NPCs for you to create if you want to create names as well. But most of them have a headquarters or at least a main gathering place in either fallen citadels or cares that were lost to horrors. Yeah. I mean, it's a natural environment for them to be in. One, because obviously you're not going to be advertising your presence in a storefront in barter town uh that you are a, <laughs> an organization dedicated to the worship and service of yeah the great cosmic evil but also sort of the very nature of being associated with a horror is corrupting and would draw people to ruined or abandoned or somehow yeah. corrupt so, places uh have fun playing around with all of that we're gonna throw some more at you here because there are different uh, uh, cells of the cult of the Great Hunter, and they all have their own little motives and things, it's kind of hard to define each single cell's goals and objectives. So if you try one and it doesn't necessarily work out, there's another cell, come up with a different you know, motivation and so forth, and keep, you keep trying until you get it right. <clears throat> so one of the, there are three main reasons that the cults exist, because they keep getting supplies of people who believe in kind of the same thing. They're there for one of three different reasons. And if you want to create more, by all means, create more. First one, they probably support Vergigor Vergigorm's goal of corrupting all of the dragons. Secondly, they either devote themselves to the most powerful and the corrupt, and they kind of worship power and nihilism in that way. So, you know, if you're going to go for it, go for the best, and that would be Vergigorm. Or third, they just loathe and hate dragons for whatever reasons, be they legitimate, be they made up, be they out of uh, an unfounded reasoning. Um, but they, those folks are likely just to try and confront dragons and dragon servants on their own. They won't last long doing that, but you know, they're going to try anyway. So those are, those are three of the main reasons people would join this cult. Yeah. So the goals and objectives of a particular cell of the cult would largely be dependent on the reason that they are doing what they're doing. Yeah. Worshipping <laughs> the horror. Yeah, what they're doing, what they're doing. Those who are in it for the personal power, kind of the, the second group, like those who believe that in service to a powerful entity, that they might get some of that glory reflected on them in the sense that, oh, if I serve the thing that will rule the world then per and I further those aims, then perhaps I will be rewarded in a sense. Whereas those who do it because they loathe or fear dragons are allying themselves with sort of a, yes, it may be a horror, but it is a horror that is seeking mm -hmm. to destroy that which I hate. And so therefore I will serve and help its goals the in that regard. Enemies, my friend. <laughs> Yeah. yeah, in a way. So there's different ways that you can approach it and what a particular faction or individual cell might be up to will depend on what it is that, that they're after. The cult that appears in Shattered Pattern is sort of of the first type, doing what they can to corrupt the dragons, uh, in this case, dealing with their eggs and, and using pretty nasty and powerful blood magic rituals to screw with yeah. dragon mm -hmm. eggs and stuff. Yeah. Yeah. There's a bunch of different stuff that, that you can do and, you know, make it 
to either have like one particular sect that the group keeps running into and might need to thwart their plans, or if you're looking at a sort of more broadly spanning kind of thing, just have different cells that they encounter, perhaps each working on a different approach to some kind of greater calamity or issue, or just simply escalating stakes that um, different cells are involved with as the group advances in experience and just use that as a theme of the sort of inherent ongoing scars of the scourge and the corruption involved and stuff like that. It is good to note though, uh, as far as the in-game information is concerned, none of the, sorry, none of these cells has actually received Vergigorm's direct support that we know of. (laughs) (laughs) That we know of. The number of rumors that exist of cells of the cult that have somehow contacted or or summoned aspects of the horror are numerous, but very few confirmed. A lot of games that I'm aware of, sort of that people talk about online when they are dealing, if they are dealing with horrors in the cult of the Great Hunter, typically have some kind of big climax that involves a ritual that is supposed to bring Virgigorm into our world. Uh, and yeah. trying to put a stop to it so, and that sort of thing. Uh, either way, if you're dealing with Vergigorm or his followers, this is not a, a place to tread lightly or uh, take nonchalantly. These are uh, Vergigorm, uh, you know, itself is just a big bad nasty. And I'm assuming that anybody who's dedicated to that kind of end of the world destruction, end of dragons, end of uh, society at large, and just let the horror does do what it's supposed to do. They're not nice people. Just saying. <laughs> They're they are to be taken very, very seriously. That's my that's my two cents on that one. So how would you really incorporate somebody who so there's a there's an adventure idea in the in the essay at the end where it says, We assume that you've worked with dragons before to kind of get the, the lead in here, you know, bait the hook for dealing with the cult of the great hunter. If somebody has not worked for a dragon, has not dealt with a dragon, how would you incorporate this cult to get them to see, to get your players to see what could be done. Yeah. I mean, I think any kind of situation, if you want to deal with a game that reflects the damage that has been done to people as a result of the scourge, damage to the world, damage to society, the harm that has been done to people, and you don't necessarily want to turn it into a horror of the week type game, where oh like each other like each adventure you just kind of fight your way yeah. through progressively tougher and more difficult horrors dealing with a cult that has name givers that serve or worship the horror in some capacity that could be up to various things uh you know if if you've got a game that is going to deal with the dragons in some sense i mean if you talk about and you go back and you listen to the episodes that we did on the various great dragons and common antagonist that you might run into with some of those would be cells of the cult of the great hunter. You could even, in a sense, obviously the scale wouldn't be quite as large, but you could use the cult of the great hunter merely as inspiration for another horror cult or organization that might be worshiping yeah. another horror that you come up with on your own um, that's that's serving its own ends and whatnot. You could perhaps just use the cult as this kind of boogeyman background sort of story to deal with the the notions of that there are people out there who will willingly serve and worship these entities. And they are not necessarily people who were who were broken. I mean, they are in their own way, but that whole kind of thing, you know, whether you are directly dealing with the dragons or not. This is a great cult of individuals that could be up to various nefarious deeds in one sense or another, depending on the themes and and ideas that you want to explore in your game. If you want to look at twisted blood magic or nethermantic rituals or the kind of body horror and corruption that can come about as a result of that, the cult of the great hunter could be involved in that sort of thing, or there could be individuals that are uncovered some of their mysteries and are exploring things that perhaps they shouldn't. Uh, If you're dealing with those who are more interested in 
power and personal edification in that sense and are in service to the horror out of the the belief in what it could do you know you get to a, a situation where you perhaps have a town or a village or a group of elite people in a larger community that are sort of corrupt officials in some sense perhaps even like having layers where perhaps there's a group of people who oh yes we're all part of this kind of elite skull and bones cloaked and hooded you know society that is that the members of the upper classes of this community are all part of and maybe not necessarily aware or recognizing the degree to which what they are doing is furthering the goals of somebody a little bit higher up that is manipulating them. There's a lot of different stuff that you could do with them, but all of them ultimately are going to tie into one or more of the themes and motives of people that are members of the cult. Fair. I think that kind of wraps it up because there's not a lot you can't do with this cult because they can be anywhere doing anything. And again, if you did one, one little sect to try and didn't quite work out for you, you have more sects and more uh, variety in what they are willing to do, their motives, their modus operandi, and so forth and so on. So uh, if you have any questions for us <clears throat> or want to give us an example of how you used the Cult of the Great Hunter in your game, we'd love to read it because we love all these little stories we get uh, people send to us. So drop us a line at edsgpodcast at gmail.com or leave us a voicemail. Any final thoughts on this nefarious group of uh, misanthropes? No, they're pretty straightforward. There's a lot that you can do with them, but they are like a fairly straightforward antagonist group in that regard. You know, your standard sort of horror cult, they just happen to be in service to the biggest, baddest, uh, <laughs> most eldritch horror of them all. Yeah. No lie there. So until next time, folks, uh, I think it's time for you to go hunt the great hunter for your own legend or however that's going to work. Good night, everybody. Good night.